Hello and welcome to The Cellar Door. I'm your host, George Gaylor, and today we're at Red Hill Estate in the beautiful Mornington Peninsula. Come and join me while we taste some gorgeous wines and get an insight into Red Hill Estate. So Frank, you are the owner of Red Hill Estate. Yes, I am. Thank you so much for having us here. It's oh, no, beautiful. Tell us a little bit about your history with Red Hill Estate. I purchased Red Hill back in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, bit of a story with that one is that I actually purchased a company called Chevy Bridge, which was, was a public company. Sure, and that was and, quite a large. Yeah, quite a large. And it had a number of brands in it. Mm -hmm. And Red Hill happened to be sitting inside that particular company. Um, there's a bit of a story behind that in that I actually um, purchased that in 2012 but my first visit to Red Hill was actually 2014. So it was two years from the time you bought it until the time you came to the cellar door. Exactly. How was, was that, your first moment uh, here? Very exciting when I came through those gates mm -hmm. and that beautiful view that we have out there. Now, obviously the best view in the world. <laughs> Officially. <laughs> Officially, yeah. yes. And I remember um, yeah, meeting the staff here and I couldn't get back to head office quick enough to sort of ask everybody why and they hadn't anyone told me about the Red Hill Estate mm -hmm. and the beautiful views and actually the wines that we actually have. So but this was where you wanted to be? This is where I wanted to be from the day I walked in that front gate mm -hmm. and um, since then I've been sort of working my way to being here full time. Yeah, and you're quite involved in the winemaking and the growing of the grapes. Yes. Tell us a bit about that. I've been in the industry over 30 years and mm. I started off uh, working in the vineyard and um, working with the wines and life's taken me, took me on a long journey <laughs> through the wine industry. Um, so originally you were fruit and veg? Yes, yes. I was fruit and veg for a number of years, mm -hmm. um, up to about 28, 29. Okay, yeah. I was. Um, so only a couple of years ago then? Yeah, just a couple. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> then I wandered into the um, the wine business by accident. Um, a um, good friend of mine that I went to school with had a vineyard and asked me to come and help. And you know, I've been in the wine business ever since. Mm -hmm. So, right. And listen, you know, life took me on a journey. Um, you know, started off um, uh, working in the Hunter Valley with um, Hunter Valley Company there. and. Were After you owning and managing then, or? I was actually managing the actual, I was actually working more on the sales side, on the brands, but I soon got a passion for, for the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up um, looking after the vineyards, which I really enjoyed at the time. Yeah. And, and then, still do. And still do. Oh, it's, it's my passion. That's why I'm here at Red Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up, um, after about four or five years in Hunter, I had an opportunity to go to America for the company. As uh, you do. As you do. <laughs> As I was, ended up spending seven years in, in the US. Uh, in the Napa region? Or? Actually, it was in um, the Central Coast region, which is more that Paso Robles area, which is halfway between San Francisco and LA. Okay. Um, had plenty of trips in Napa, of course. Yeah, of yeah. course. And I, I think that's where my passion actually really grew for Pinots. Yeah, that is quite a famous Pinot area. Yeah. Yeah. And Red Hill Estate is renowned for its Pinot. Exactly. In yes. fact, I believe your first vintage of Pinot, 2014? Well, wasn't, our first vintage was 212. Yeah. But um, yes, our- But that you were sort of involved that in- 214 heavily. vintage yeah. um, was one of the, well, the best vintage we have had here. Mm -hmm. um, and it won gold. Oh, well, won blue gold, yes. Blue gold. Blue gold. That's better than gold. Yeah, well, best wine in show. It's pretty And good. that was the uh, international uh, Pinot show. Cool climate Pinot show. So. Now, talk to me about the cool climate because that is an official classification. It is. It is. Uh, cool climate, it's about uh, elevation and or um, temperature. Okay. The cool climate classification varies around the world, so it's a little bit of a, oh. uh, a loose term, mm -hmm. can we say? But Mornington is definitely sits within that international uh, cool climate um, classification. Mm -hmm. And so, Basically, it's 300 metres in uh, altitude and mean temperatures under 90 degrees over the year. So the cool climate classification means for us wine drinkers that don't know the technical stuff okay. that you grow great <coughs> Pinot Noir, yep. 
Chardonnay. Chardonnay. And look, in cool climate, we can also get other varieties that do well. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the Mornington Peninsula, the Pinot Gris does um, extremely well as well. With the cool climate, the classification basically is about altitude and mean, average mean temperature over the year. Most of the fruit here will come off the vines, um, depending on the season, of course. Because <clears throat> we do have a, um, a change in our seasons over the last few years because of the yeah. um, climate change that we're having across yep. the, the country. But normally we, we're always picking at the later part of the year, uh, of the season, compared to, say, the Hunter Valley or the Brossa, where it's a lot warmer. warmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We normally will keep picking right through until the end of April. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now you get to take these grapes that you were talking to me about, the process begins for you on the vine. Exactly, yeah. It actually, the process starts today for next year. Like we, once we finish right. picking, um, the process starts all over again. So you're back out on those vines? We're back out on those vines. So now it's time to uh, prepare for pruning again. Um, so is the pruning the way that you hone the, the particular flavours of the grapes according to which the, the wine you Well, the pruning is more uh, about what quantity of grapes you actually end up with on the vine. And does that affect their flavour? Yes. Right. Yeah. So more grapes, less flavour. Uh-huh. Okay. So a vine has can only have so much nutrients and can only feed, you know, like it can only bring up so much goodness mm -hmm. for the grapes. So if you have, it's like you know having a family of nine or a family of three. You know? <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. um, you can actually, by pruning the way we prune, uh, by keeping the, the um, actual volume of grapes per vine, the number of bunches per vine, Low, mm -hmm. um, we get more goodness to the actual grape itself and we get more flavours um, which eventually end up in the bottle. Max, you are the Max of Max's restaurant. Yes, Max this Paganoni. Is, yes. Yes, I started here in 1994. Amazing. So you have been here for almost the years. entire time that I have been here for the entire time there's been a restaurant here because I built it. You did? Yeah. Okay, so talk us through your arrival at Red Hill Estate and how this magnificent restaurant came to be. Sure, but when I got back from living in Europe for two years, I came up here for a wine tasting and I met the owner of the property, which was Sir Peter Derren. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, whoever's got this property is an idiot because they should have a restaurant here. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, who are you calling an idiot? I'm Sir Peter Derham. <laughs> and I thought anyone who calls himself a Sir is an idiot. But anyway. <laughs> you clearly got over that. <laughs> got over that, that piece, yeah. yeah. Um, and I said to him, if he built a restaurant, he said, if he built the restaurant, would I rent it off him? And we did a handshake deal. Mm -hmm. And he built the restaurant and I started renting it off him. And that was 1994. Amazing. Yeah. But you didn't rent for too long. No, so I rented it for three years and then we went into a formal lease because at the start it was just a handshake deal. And then three years after that, um, I said to him, look, if I'm going to stay here, I really need some of the dirt because I'm building a reputation, mm -hmm. so I need to own some of the land. So I bought into the property then. And you have built quite the reputation. Yeah, sure. It's one best winery restaurant in Australia, mm. best tourism re restaurant in Australia, Chef's Hats, um, Qantas Awards. Just it's a few little. Just a few, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we work with the local tourism boards too, sort of, to bring down international and local tourists. Mm -hmm. And you work quite closely with the Mornington region in terms of produce that you use and... Yeah, well, so I was born and bred on the Mornington Peninsula, so oh, that sure. sort of helps. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the local producers I know, and they're friends of mine, so the menu's sort of based off what's available at the time. So we do, in winter we have uh, truffle hunts, where we go and source truffles. We take a little dog called Thomas and it's the cutest little dog too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we do our truffle hunts. Um, we also do mushroom meanders where I take people around and teach them which mushrooms you can and cannot eat. A very good skill. It's a good skill to mm. have. And because we're in Red Hill with the pine trees here, we get a lot of pine mushrooms. So that's... And you can eat them. You can eat them. They're and beautiful. they're delicious. They're delicious, Great. yeah. And so all the produce that we collect and that sort of thing is reflected on the menu. So menu changes seasonally, so four times a year. Mm -hmm. And, and it's much, your design. And it's my design. It's, so it's pretty much what is available at the time. So changes with the seasons. Have you always been a chef? Always been around food? I have always, yes, I'm from an Italian family. 
and my mum inspired me to cook. <laughs> So yeah, I've always liked cooking. Even when I was a kid, I used to make my brothers and sisters mud pies and make them eat it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I've always enjoyed food and I enjoy food and wine matching too. That's sort of what our specialty is here. Yeah, so do you work closely with Frank? Yeah, very much so. So we work together once the wine's made, it's blended and then I taste it and match it with uh, food that we've got on the menu. And you're the designer of the menu. Yeah, mm. yeah. So that's I've started off as the chef here. That's how I got into this mess in the first place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this beautiful mess. Yeah, it's a good mess. Yeah. What for you has been one of the highlights of your time at Red Hill? I would have to say seeing the peninsula develop because 25 years ago there was nothing here. You were the first winery restaurant. Yeah, that's right. So there was no one else here, and it was. And now it's developed as now it's a tourism destination and. People say to me, God, Max, you're so lucky to be here. And I just tell them, look, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So it's... Funny how that works. Yeah, it is. Because 25 years ago, it was a three hour trip from Melbourne. So it was too far to go. People sure. would come and they'd stay for a few days, but they wouldn't come down. Now they come for lunch, mm -hmm. you know, one hour. Uh, we had a group today land by helicopter, which had flown down. I know. Yeah. And that happens regularly. Yeah, yeah. So they fly down from Melbourne and it's only a I think a 10 minute flight from Melbourne. So we package with them and do a three course lunch, matching wine. Oh, great. Yeah. And you do wedding packages as well? We do lots of weddings. Mm -hmm. so we do lots of weddings here because the property is so beautiful. Mm. Um, and we've got a great reputation for the food and wine to match. So it's sort of a great spot to get married. They can get married on site here and then have the reception and it's all here. So you were led back to Red Hill and Mornington Peninsula because it was home? Yeah, because I was born on, I was born in Tyre, which is about 20 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. And so after I finished my apprenticeship, I went to Europe and traveled for two years, working, cooking, doing all sorts of things. Enjoying. Yeah, enjoying. <laughs> then when I came back home, I came up here and found this restaurant, or well, found this winery, yep. which didn't have a restaurant. So I thought, what a great place to be. Mm. Max, thank you so much for having us. Happy 25th anniversary. Thank you. Here's to another 25. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> great, thank you. of bottles and flavours, shall we oh, yeah. crack okay. into a couple? Now we've got three that we're going to try today. The first one is a Pinot Grigio, now this is our 2017. Um, so you don't age a Pinot Grigio for long? No, well basically um, what I tell most people that come to my cellar door, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of a story about Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is actually a Pinot Gris grape. So they're not two different things? No, they're, there's only one grape and that's a Pinot Gris. So, you, so we have Pinot Grigio. Why does it have two different names, Frank? <laughs> because the Italians uh -huh. <laughs> calls theirs Pinot Grigio. Right. So basically they're two different, same grape, two different styles. Okay. So Pinot Grigio is Italian style. Mm -hmm. So it's tend to picked a little bit earlier. Okay. Uh, does that mean it's less sweet? Yes, yeah, so a little bit lower in alcohol, a little okay. bit less sugar. It doesn't see a barrel, it goes straight into a, um, a stainless steel that uh -huh. and gets processed and a Pinot Grigio is normally ready within about six months. Okay, um, be good for me, I'm very impatient. Or so are Italians, Italians <laughs> are very impatient. <laughs> so that's the Italian style. Great. The Pinot Gris, same grape, is picked a little bit later, mm -hmm. usually a week to two weeks, just get the... Um, Such the, a fine time isn't it? It is. Such a delicate well, balance. A day could make a big difference between a great wine and a wine you just missed out on. <laughs> so yes, it's um, it does take a bit of uh, finesse, and, mm. um, and you walk the vineyards, and a lot of winemakers will want to do things by numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, here at Red Hill, we do things by flavour. Yeah, we, we go out there and we just keep tasting mm -hmm. and tasting, and then when so you're literally picking the grape yeah. off the vine. And when we're happy with the flavour, that's when we start picking. Mm -hmm. So back to the Pinot Gris, mm. the French. They'll pick it a bit later and they'll put it to a barrel. Okay. They've got a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And a lot of barrels. Yeah. And it usually takes about a year. So ah. it's about six months longer uh -huh. than the Pinot Gris. Mm -hmm. Grigio. So let's get down with the Pinot Gris. Yes, let's. So, what sort of flavour notes am I looking for in this? Do a bit of a swell. Okay. Now, Pinot Grigio is a lighter style. Mm -hmm. So, you're looking for things like a Christmas, uh, a Nashi pear in, in ours. Oh, yeah. You'll we'll pick mm -hmm. up a bit of Nashi pear. There's a pear in there. There's a pear. <laughs> a 
very floral. Mm. It's not, yeah, there's a sweetness, but it's not overwhelming no. at all. Do we sip now? Now we sip. Now we sip. So you get the acidity. It's, all, it's quite savoury. Very savoury, and mm. there's a little bit of acid, like a little mm -hmm. bit of a... Like a little tingle on tingle, your palate. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful, like, hot summer day. Mm. This is the sitting around around the barbecue. Mm -hmm. This is just yeah. perfect. So it's a good food wine as well. Look, Italians tend to do wines for both. Sure. They tend to have you know, wine that will work both just to drink mm -hmm. or to put with food. Mm -hmm. um, and is this one of those? Or? This is one of yep. those. This is the Italian one. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas the French tend to more, to more towards food. Oh, sure. One of the other little unusual things about our Pinot Grigio is if you hold it up, you'll see there's a bit of a... Pinot Grigio is usually very, very clear. It's almost um, as clear as oh, yeah. tap water. Mm -hmm. It's got it has a little a bit of a golden hue. Yeah, it's got a little bit of a tinge there. Mm -hmm. and it's because one of the things we've done, just to give us a little point of difference, we've actually left on skins for a couple uh -huh. of days, just a couple of days to get that little bit more structure mm -hmm. in the grape that you don't normally get with a Pinot Grigio. Okay, the next one we're moving going on. to try, and moving on, this is Merrick's, which is our mid-range um, here at Red Hill. Mm -hmm. And this one has about 30% um, new oak. We use one, two, three, four, and five-year-old barrels okay. for the balance. Mm -hmm. And what you get is a, a, a very light style, mm -hmm. um, very um, fruit-driven. Mm -hmm. And what you'll pick up mostly in this particular one is uh, a melon. Okay. A lovely melon flavour. Delicious. You'll Sticking with the table. Yeah. You, this spends about, um, and it only spends um, uh, about 12 months in oak. Mm -hmm. You do still get those oaky oh, undertones. Yes. You yeah. get the oaky mm. undertones, but it's not overwhelming. It's not. No. Oak enhances the wine. Mm -hmm. and, it, um, and you. You need it for that structure. It's like salt on meat. Yeah, yeah correct, yeah. Um, but you don't want, like meat, you don't want it to be salty, mm -hmm. and then you can't taste the meat. Mm -hmm. So oak's the same. There's a balancing between the fruit and that undertone of oak. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Mm. You pick up that melon. I do, yep. It's like also like a peach kind of. Yes, mm. yes, yes. Some stone fruit there as well. Yeah. That's fairly normal for typical for a Chardonnay. Mm. So yeah, it is that kind of. It's not. I mean, it definitely has structure and, yeah. and weight to it, but it isn't that. No, it's big. It's not overwhelming. Mm. But that's also part of the cool climate as well, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because uh, in a cool climate environment that we have here, uh, the grapes take longer to ripen. Mm -hmm. So we end up with a more softer, delicate, uh, elegant style wine uh -huh. than we normally would in the, again in the warmer in areas. The warm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. must be why I'm enjoying it. <laughs> the elegance. Well, we, this particular Chardonnay is the um, one of the uh, favourites here at Red Hill. Mm -hmm. um, most of the customers that come in sort of tend to gravitate Go to this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And now, now we're going to try the a pinot. famous Pinot. Let's taste it. Let's taste it. This is a fancy little. It's an aerator. Mm. So this, so this is, is instead of decanting. Correct. Mm. So there's the savoury cherry yes. element. Yes, and a little bit of uh, underlining black currant. Uh huh. That's what I'm probably picking up as well. It's my favourite fruit pastel flavour. Now, oh. of course, single vineyard, hand picked, hand pressed, about 18 months in oak. Okay. With about 40, I think, what vintage is this again? No, sorry. That's oh, yeah, the seven, best. seven, 16, about 40% 40 oak, brand new oak, mm -hmm. and then aged oak as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, similar to the Chardonnay, but with a bit more time. A bit more time. Mm. With the Pinot. Um, a, little, a little bit longer, like 18 months in oak, mm. rather than 12 months mm -hmm. with our Merricks. 
and very small batch. We don't make a lot of this. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but you do a few different Pinots. In our range, we have basically three of everything. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, um, we have our Celador range, mm -hmm. we have our Merricks, mm -hmm. and then we have our single vineyard. Now you also have the bench, which I really wanted to ask you about. Okay. The bench we did for, um, as a um, special uh, branding for uh, MS Australia, mm. as for multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Is this a cause close to your heart? It is. Uh, multiple sclerosis runs within um, uh, my family. Mm -hmm. So it was something that we really wanted to um, help with uh, fundraising. And with all our bench sales, we actually donate $1 per bottle mm -hmm. to MS. It's fantastic. Um, so the slogan is uh, Kiss MS Goodbye. And we're hoping that we're actually helping in that to happen. Lovely. So, and of course, the bench is available what? at the front door. How about that? <laughs> you can actually go and sit on the bench and drink the bench. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>
<laughs> and um, you know, the story goes that when the lands were first settled, um, the, the settlers took their water from water sources. So out here, our dam is actually, actually a part of the Eringberg Creek, which flows from the high country right through to the Yarra River. Right. And um, after heavy rains, that water would be muddy. Yep. So the indigenous people would say, you know, Warramunda, Warramunda, wait till tomorrow, the cold, clean water coming out of the stream is better to drink, don't drink the muddy water. And from our it's point of clever. view, um, <laughs> wait till tomorrow translates beautifully to our wines because oh, they're, they're great today, but they they sell beautifully. So incredible. Yeah. So the vi there were some vines here. Yeah. Well, when we took over, it was an existing, what well, I'd say, commercial vineyard. It was contracted to supply fruit to another winery, uh, and we had three years left to run on that contract. So in that period of time, we focused on reshaping the vineyard. So, for example, we moved away from a tr typical spur pr spur pruned mm -hmm. uh, vine and moved to a cane prune and then eventually an arch cane prune. Um, we changed some canopy management, certainly soil management. Mm. Um, and um, we, you know, we, we focused on those changes across the first few years and then yeah. of course, to the point where we thought, look, you know what, let's, uh, let's make wine. Time to make the jump. You're Robert and Irene's daughter, yep. but you're also <laughs> a significant part of this business. Tell me about your pathway to being in the wine industry. It's probably a long-winded answer, but I grew up in it. Um, yep. You know, Warramunda is our second property, but I remember vividly as a toddler having to like be with mum and dad in the vineyard up in Kyneton and it was always just a part of my life. It was like, where do you live? Oh, I live on a vineyard. Yeah. It was this, you know, unusual sort of a philosophy and place for a kid to be in and not to ma mention like what the actual physicality of it is sure. like what do you do on your day off I play in a vineyard yeah how do you do that <laughs> what do you mean sort of a co like a notion of it and then as I grow up I mean like any kid you kind of rebel a little bit and you remove yourself from it and I think dad had me set up to be you know go do winemaking go do this and loaded me full of science subjects at school and then right at like the last kind of minute literally went up and went change and started doing art stuff and completed certificate fours and designs and obviously VCE and then moved more into a film and t television background and more so in makeup and makeup effects and learning my way through that, navigating my life through that and then pretty much coming full circle again and then mm. falling back into this and becoming more and more involved and really kind of putting my stamp on what it is. I remember really vividly being stuck in Los Angeles traffic, gridlocked, not being able to move and getting a phone call from dad saying, oh, hey, you know, you're coming home in a few more weeks and this is what we've done and getting a photo sent through of that label. And it was like, <laughs> I'm, 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 my name is on a, on a bottle. And I remember a friend saying, you're now a wine. Like, <laughs> really? And it was just this so different multi-universe thing that all came together. And, you know, then it became like little things where I'd be on a TV show and there'd be a wine scene. I'd be like, hey, I've got a wine for you to use or just little tiny things to pull me in again. And then coming back to Salador, you know, I started out in Salador. One of my first jobs was at another winery down the road here and at another vineyard and all these sort of things. And coming back and realizing that I did enjoy it. Like it wasn't just to remove myself from it because oh no, it's what my parents do and they wanted me to do this. So I have to rebel. It was more of this, it's what I should be doing. You know, removing the whole concept of art. Well, what is art? Well, it can be wine, it can be marketing, it can be everything and really kind of honing my skill into this one thing. And now this is kind of this medium progression of where we're changing the label and we're reinventing it. And it's kind of more for the outlook of future years ahead of it. What the Livzac label is and why I kind of became a part of it was pretty much decisions that I made solely on my own that reflected then in a in product, which is the wine. Yeah. So pulling myself and putting myself into the wine mm. was a big, platform for it yeah sure but yeah now full-time here managing running the cellar door awesome. marketing everything and really enjoying it the Warramunda estate label is all mm -hmm. grapes grown on this property and they're very much classic Yarra Valley grape yep. varieties and What's your label focusing on? Is it that sort of thing or are you sort of going a little bit left what, of centre? What's really cool about my label is that being that it, like the word estate isn't featured anywhere means that I don't just have to get fruit from 
Boromunda Estate and I don't just have to get fruit from the Yarra Valley. It gives me a bit of freedom to kind of explore other wine regions. When I kind of look at viticulture, I'm really passionate about, first off, soils, yeah. um, elevations, you know, whether there's a lot of water or no water or impactual environmental impacts that reflect on a vineyard I think are really interesting. Yeah. Um, and then diving in further, unfortunately for people and also fortunate for people who have me in the cellar door, I will rattle on about clones and multi-clonal vineyards like we have here mm. and that sort of a thing. So that's kind of where I fall into it. Now I do, like I said, have that freedom so I can run around and go to different places and find yeah. tiny little parcels of as an example, Nebbiolo, yeah, um, cool. my first ever rosé, you know, good old 2016 Nebbiolo rosé, which was fruit sourced from an awesome vineyard down in Dixon's Creek, so lower yeah. Yarra, you know, really flat, below sea level, hotter, interesting wine, unfortunately yeah. packed a lot of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Just what you need in rosé. Yeah. <laughs> um, perfect for a day like today, <laughs> and that kind of coined my little phrase of you know, rosé, drink it, don't think it, but it is cool, you know, and That's it gives me <laughs> flexibility and it brings in a bit of quirk and a bit of different yeah, cool. atmosphere. So are you involved in selecting the grapes? Are you hanging out in the winery? How does your <laughs> yeah, involvement sorry. span over vintage? <laughs> I, um, I, I'm really passionate about the Rhone Valley. Sure. Um, I've traveled a lot through there. I absolutely love their viticulture. I love, you know, when you're driving through these regions and their vineyards are up on these mountains and you think, oh, I'd hate to pick that. I'd hate yeah, to. Yeah, I'd hate to I'd just hate be to have to, do, have to walk up that. Oh, it, you know, and they're, they're old school. <laughs> they're still using horses and carts. And mm. I fell in love with that sort of an area. And one of my biggest passions, especially from Warramunda, but in general, is I love a cool climate Syrah. I think here in Australia, I mean, we talk about the Aussie Shiraz, and it is that. It's this big, amazing wine that built an industry. Like we, you know, the Australian yeah. wine industry was built on it. But then we also have this really cool wine, which is Syrah. It's, you know, the same grapes, but climate, soil, yeah. everything affects it. I really love that. So I have my little parcel of Syrah here at Warramunda. Unfortunately Ooh. for me, 2017 being this true reserve year, this amazing year, meant that I didn't get any at all, went to Warren State. <laughs> so I ventured elsewhere and did my own thing, but yeah. I always get to come back and that kind of falls into then the philosophy of the whole Livzac range. So Ben and Brendan, we're here in the Warramunda cellar. You guys have just finished harvest. Tell me what came through the winery this year. Yeah, so this year we produced a, a Viognier. This is a, a barrel fermented, early harvested Viognier style. Awesome. A, a Marsan, which is also a barrel fermented, very textural, dry white wine style. Beautiful. We produced, produced a Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. a Syrah, and a Cabernet Sauvignon. And we also produced some other Water varieties as well. Oh, cool. So they make up the estate range. And so, what did you do for the Livzac wines? In the Livzac, we have a barrel fermented Chardonnay, mm -hmm. a fresh rose, uh, a Syrah, Pinot Noir, and a Cabernet Sauvignon. And so, in terms of regionality, you guys get to work with you know a wide range of grape varieties. How do you decide what kind of wines you're going to make? I think. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about the Yarra Valley is, mm. is the diversity and the potential um, and opportunity to, to make such a, a wide range of varieties. And I yeah. think Marsan is a great example of that. I mean, yeah. it's traditionally grown in a, a warmer climate. Mm. And they often make you know, much broader, kind of heavier, richer wines. Yeah, sure. Um, we found an opportunity here with Warramundi in a cooler climate to make yeah. something that is very fresh and lively, but also mm. still has the classic texture of Marsan. We're here in your Pinot block and we've got the 2017 Warramunda Estate Pinot. Tell me a little bit about this wine. Okay, well actually we're in the, uh, the 115, D115 uh, block here. Um, all, all the leaves have gone as you can see, so we'll be pruning yeah. very soon. Yep. Um, this particular one has got some of the 115 in it, an MV6. Mm -hmm. 17, 2017 was a really interesting year for us. The season kicked off slow, I should say. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the fruit hung probably three weeks longer than normal okay. here. Um, that resulted in obviously more ripeness. However, 
um, we were very lucky that we maintain a lot of the natural acids. So this Pinot from an alcohol perspective is a little bit high for us normally, it's about 13.2. Mm -hmm. We're normally about that 12.8, 12 12.5. Okay. 12 yep. The style of Pinot we make is um, my favourite style, which is a really dry, austere style, savoury. Yep. Um, you'll find it's, you know, it's just intensely aromatic. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, and the, the palate when you first try it, the acids, the alcohol, and the gentle, gentle fine tannin really for me wakes up the palate. Yeah. Uh, dominated by red fruits, um, you know, raspberry, strawberry, cherry, red cherry in particular. Um, the wine making is really quite interesting here. Mm. Um, what we do is we hand pick all the fruit, we sort the fruit, and basically the most uniform whole bunches go into a fermenter as whole bunch. Sure. We actually layer them, we pick in 500 kilo bins, so we layer them with dry ice, lids on, seal the lids, and basically what happens is, is the oxygen leaves the, the tanks, which triggers a carbonic reaction. Um, and we ferment like that for 14 days, typically, 12, right. 14 days. Then we open the lids, dig the fruit out, distem the fruit, and then get it back into the fermenter, let it finish off in an open pot fermenter wow. with just some plunging and pour overs. Right. Um, the other side of it, we do another ferment where we distem the fruit yep. and we get a whole berry ferment. And you have a similar outcome, another carbonic reaction which is quite monitored so we don't get too many sort of stewy jammy sugars that can come out of that reaction. Sure. Um, the wine finds itself after that into barrel, it's pressed to barrel. Mm -hmm. This particular vintage spent 16 months in oak. There's 25% there's new French oak in the blend. The rest is a blend of fill one, fill two, and all the way down to neutral. Yep. Um, and then we blend it. The wine making for me stands out, coming through smell or nose and texture. Yep. Um, oak, you get hints of clove and cedar, sort of spicy dark chocolate. Yeah. And I love the tertiary notes. Um, for me, it goes really savoury and herbal, almost capers. Yep. Uh, caper berries coming through. Yeah. On the palate, there's really sharp rhubarb, maraschino cherry. Yeah. And you know, look, there's a there's a almost a people talk of describing Pinot and they might say forest floor or something like that. <laughs> I moved to more, more of a, a charcuterie type note. Mm -hmm. You know, that cured meat, that mm -hmm. lovely Parma ham character. It's a bit um, sweeter, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's not as earthy and dense as what, you know, we're talking about earthy forest floor flavours. But this is so layered, but so gentle. Mm. And then it just finishes off with this pfft at the back, you yeah. know, and it really picks itself up. You get those sprinkles ah, of raspberry. It's fantastic, and, yeah. And, uh, strawberry at the back palate. So we've got a Marsan here to taste. Talk me through this one. Well, we've, we've been making Marsan now for seven years uh, in a row, and we're, we're really starting to see some pedigree in this, this wine now. We're starting to understand the block yeah. um, to a great extent. Um, and what, I'm, what we realise now more than ever is the importance of picking at the right time. Sure. Marsan, by nature, has, a very, has quite poor um, acid behaviour. It has right. high pH and low acid. So right. what we're realising is that um, we, if we pick a little bit earlier, um, is that the flavour and the character in the wine develops through time. Okay. So that is through right. time, in, uh, through an extended fermentation in barrel, yep. through extended lees contact in barrel, and then through some bottle age. Right. So that way we retain the natural acidity, yep. um, but we also build lots of layers of texture and character okay. through that time. So what you see in this wine is uh, some classic um, kind of pithy melon Ooh. and nut characters coming through some suggestions of honey, which is quite classic of, yep. of Marsan as a variety. But there's also these um, suggestions of more floral notes, like yep. frangipani and, and mm. some of those slightly clovey notes. So Brennan, can you talk me through Marsan as a grape in the wider world of wine? Sure, it's uh, from the Rhone Valley, Southern Rhone Valley. Yep. You know, in Australia, it's, it's, it's pretty thin on the ground, really. It's not a very yeah. common variety. There are some very old plantings, yep. which suggest it was was popular back in um, back when people start started bringing cuttings to Australia, mm. but yeah, really, it's just concentrating on, on in production. So, there is in, it considered an Rome. alternative variety, or is it just rare? Full stop. Uh, I think this firmly sits in the old alternative yeah. variety camp. Okay. Yeah. Marsan has typically been grown in the warmer climates of, sure. of Victoria, such as Central Victoria, and that's where we see a lot of those heavier, full, fuller-bodied styles. Um, and I think there's a great opportunity here in the Yarra Valley mm. um, to, to look at a different side of Marsan, which yeah. is that fresher, highly aromatic, um, very textural. Yeah. It, it still has the Marsan personality, but yep. it has a great freshness and, and potential to age.
So tell me about the wine that we've got in front of us. Yes, so this is my 2016 Livzac Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Multi-clonal, so we've got two clones in here. We've got SA125 and Raynella. Cabernet for me is a really interesting one. I love Cabernet Sauvignon, I think it's a really interesting wine. That being said, I'm not the typical person to buy it, and that's because often the ones I'll buy are very old, which means they sure. come with a big price tag. Yeah. I kind of tempered the winemaking for this to reflect on what I would prefer to drink, which yeah, sure. is, we're doing, you know, it's a co-ferment, so those two clones come into one fermenter together. Mm -hmm. It's whole berry, yep. um, and it's a nice, long, slow, long, gentle ferment. It fermented for just over three months, which is oh, long. Wow. It was just yeah. ticking along beautifully. 16 was such a compressed year. You know, we had everything ripening basically together. Yep. Pinot, Marsan, Viognier, Chardonnay, everything bang. Then Shiraz like a week later and then Cab Sab two weeks later after that. I think it benefited from that. Yeah. Um, and great skin to juice contact yep. from across cool. the board. Yeah, um, colour's amazing. Yeah, it's coming through beautifully. Where it differs from, especially the Warramunda in this case is, we go into barrels, but we go into those barrels for 24 months. Oh, wow. So it's a long time yeah. in oak. A majority of it is more neutral oak as well. Yep. So really kind of playing on that whole micro-oxygenation feel where mm. it's aging quicker yep. in that larger format yep. than it would say in a bottle. So it drinks like it's older. Okay. Um, I get a lot more garnety hues. Yeah, out it of is. It. It certainly doesn't have and the bright pink hue that you associate with young Exactly. Wine. And even down to like nose for me and palate, mm. I get this really interesting sort of like tertiary characteristic. So you know, more cooked plums or so than, you know, fresh plums. I get yeah. really interesting blackberry jams, but not a sweetness, just the yep. richness of it is probably the better way to term it. Nice tannin structure. Mm. We're not, you know, aggressively plunging the cap at all during fermentation. Um, if yeah. anything, we're using gravity and we're really pulling that up over the cap to rometage and yep. I don't want a big chalky aggressive yeah. cab sab and I also don't want any green elements coming through. We can make some of the best Cabernets ever. Mm. We're not as well known as other wine regions here in Australia for it. Yep. But done right with the right location, the right block, you can really pull through a beautiful Cabernet Sauvignon. In the cellar door, you guys are both here. Like if people are visiting, they're meeting you. Yeah, yeah I've seen Liv, our daughter, she worked, the three of us working there with the lady Susie works with us as well, so there's four of us. Fantastic. Mm. What happens at the cellar door here? Can you taste your wines and the yeah. Warramunda so estate? How, this, how our beautiful cellar door runs is you come in, grab a seat, you feel really welcomed and that's a big thing. Um, I love going into cellar doors where you're made to feel like you, you're meant to be there. Yeah. That whole notion of it. So you're really welcomed in. We set you down with a little bit of cheese. The traditional cheese of Warramunda is Spanish Manchego. Amazing. It goes so well with the wine, mm. so why not give it to everybody? Yeah. And then you get a really beautiful dedicated tasting of both ranges. So a little bit of Livzac, a little bit of Warramunda. I think the notion of coming in and actually being able to speak to somebody who's, you know, we don't just work here, we live here. Yeah. We breathe it. It's a part of our DNA, it's part of our life. Yeah. It's really quite a unique experience mm. because not many places can you go now where you're speaking to the people who are physically doing it. Yeah. Really beautiful feedback we get from people is that, you know, you've made us feel a part of your family, which is yeah. probably one of the best sort of compliments yeah. we can get because yeah. in the reality, you're just being you. You're just yeah. being, yeah. you know, what we do and we want to showcase what we can provide to people and what we produce is probably mm. the biggest one. So when you get that sort of a feedback, it's really beautiful. And exactly. to be able to stand behind those wines and be proud of them and show them to people yourself yeah. is such a brilliant way exactly. to communicate what you're doing and, and why you do it. I mean, the funniest well. thing for me is when someone goes, oh, yeah, 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 wait, Liv, oh, <laughs> Liv. It's, it's, you're, you're on the bottle. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> well, Liv, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to hear your take on thank this you. fantastic family business, and I look forward to trying more wines. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>